So welcome Kelly Moreau and Jennifer Johnson from Bastyr University and apologies to Jennifer for not having her photo and and name up on our slides, but this is a really exciting last minute uh, event to, to ha have the pleasure of having Jennifer join us as well as Kelly, because Jennifer just got back from vacation. So Jen, thank you so much for, for being able to make this on your first day back. And I'd like to turn it over to, to you both and ask you to introduce yourselves and then we'll, we'll get right into it. So thank you. All right, thank you for having us. Um, so I'm Kelly Morrow, and um, I'm a registered dietitian, and I've also um, been working at Bastier for about 17 years. Um, I'm, the, I'm an associate professor in um, nutrition and exercise science. I'm also the nutrition clinic coordinator. And on my bio, you also see that I'm chair of dietitians in integrative and functional medicine, which is a practice group of um, dietitians who specialize in integrative and functional approaches um, through the Academy of Nutrition. And I'm Jennifer Johnson, naturopathic physician. I'm an associate clinical dean here at the School of Naturopathic Medicine, and I'm clinical associate professor. And um, Kelly and I work together in the clinic. I do oversee the naturopaths, but um, I'm participating today to help to answer any questions about um, some of the more administrative or um, technical aspects of clinical registration or um, um, that aspect of things. So I'm happy to participate at the last minute <laughs> and uh, glad to be here um, as part of the group. And I'm so glad to have you here, um, Jennifer, because the nutrition department at the clinic is much smaller than the naturopathic program, and so um, I'm, I'm happy that you'll be able to share some of your perspective, too. Yeah, sure. Wonderful. Well, I, I've been more in communication with Kelly since I uh, didn't know we'd have the pleasure of having Jen on. And, and Jen, if I remember correctly, you are the one that introduced me to Kelly, so thank you for that. And as I was telling Kelly, the way that we've been working is the clinical working group over the years has generated a very broad set of questions. And those are listed further down the slides. We have one, two, three, four pages of questions. And from those, we ask every time we have such a presentation such as today, we send the questions out and ask, our, our members, what are you most interested in hearing about? And it can be a question off the list or another question. And we have a number of uh, questions that were requested for today. And what I'd like to do is just start off before we get to these, these questions, just hear from both of you whatever um, you'd like to, to tell us about your experience, just how the clinic works. And then we can go to those questions if they haven't just been answered just as part of the conversation. I'll, I'll put them on the screen again. That might, might help uh, facilitate mm -hmm. you telling us about your clinic. And, and then we can open it up to questions from people who are actually on the call. So how does that sound to you? Sounds good. Okay, so I'll put the questions back up. And then, uh, but, but don't feel that you need to answer those first. You... Mm -hmm can use them as a guideline if you want, or just begin by, as you were telling, as if you were just telling somebody who didn't know anything about your clinic, because most of us don't, how it okay. works in general. Do you want to start, Jen, or do you want me to? No, you, if, you're, if you're ready, go ahead. Okay. And I'll take that. So um, the Bastyr Center for Natural Health, um, we are a community-based clinic um, in just a little bit north of downtown Seattle. And um, we see, I think, how many patients do we see per year? That's probably something I should have figured out, but I think I want to say, is it 60,000 or more? Oh, um, that's a good question. I can look into that while you Okay. Talk. Yeah, so um, we do, we have... Um, uh, we have most of our programs that are at the university are represented at the clinic. So we do um, have, we uh, have naturopathic medicine, and within that we have 
um, homeopathy and physical medicine and counseling, um, biofeedback. We also um, have um, nutrition. We have um, East Asian medicine. Um, we've got acupuncture, Chinese herbs, and um, a newer service that we have is Ayurveda. So we have a lot of opportunities for interdisciplinary um, integration. And I think it's been something that has been a goal for a long time. And because we have a, a, a lot of clinicians and a lot of different providers and adjuncts moving through the clinic, the organization of that has been um, has had flow that has been um, uh, in various forms over over the years. And so in some ways it depends on um, timing. So I think, it's been challenging having people work together just in terms of the asynchronous nature of when people are at the clinic. And um, one of the things that we did try to do to help promote more interdisciplinary communication was that we have um, uh, the whole clinic is closed between 12 and 1. And um, so I know for myself, if I'm at the clinic at that time, there are a lot more people milling around. That's usually a time for conversations. Um, and so that, that's been really helpful to have a specific time that, um, that we can all potentially um, communicate with each other. Um, you know, we've, um, over the years, had a variety of different shifts that have been specifically designated as interdisciplinary shifts. And we have a variety of clinicians that are, are working together at the same time. And in other instances, we have interdisciplinary um, teams that might not be working, say, um, on the same shift, but they're, they're collaborating with each other. So a couple of examples would be um, our probably most longstanding was our immune wellness shift. And um, we've also, um, our cardiovascular and diabetes shift has been one of the, um, one of the ones that's um, really been going well recently, and we have um, naturopaths and nutrition on that shift. On the um, immune wellness shift, we've had nature, naturopathy and um, acupuncture, and at some times in the history, we've also had nutrition on that shift, or they just refer over to us. Um, our most recent integrative shift is our um, digestive uh, our digestive health shift, where we have um, nutrition and um, naturopathy working together. And in some cases, what we're doing is we'll actually have a nutrition student who's completed some of their rotations go and actually take that shift as, a, as an elective. And then I'm available to work with the student um, to support their learning and any of the interventions that they might need to do. Um, while they're on that shift, in addition to the, the naturopaths who also are trained, um, obviously, in nutrition as well. So um, those, are, those are the main intentional integrative shifts. And I think that um, one of the things that we're, we're still working towards is how we can improve communication. I think that's really, I think that's really been the biggest challenge for us, um, just in terms of how everyone is moving so quickly and there's so many moving parts and so many people um, that are moving through the clinic. How do, we, how do we communicate effectively? And so I think, you know, we do have an electronic record where we can communicate with each other. So we've been working hard on doing things like writing coordination of care letters and just staff messaging and communicating with each other. Um, I have a few doctors that we actually text each other, but we don't text any HIPAA or we stay HIPAA compliant, we'll just say, hey, do you have a second to talk? Um, or, I, you know, thanks for the referral. We don't list any names, but we'll, we'll, um, we'll say, I'm seeing your patient, you know, this afternoon. Do you have a minute to chat? So we've really tried to come up with some different creative ways that we can communicate with each other. But I think that's, that's the piece that um, I think has been a challenge in just getting us to work work together more, but it's 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 definitely um, there's a few different ways that we've been that we've been trying. Did you want to add anything about that, 
Jennifer, from your perspective in terms of the history of integration and I think <clears throat> excuse me, I think you've done a good job. I think like you were saying, the noon time, we have had different versions of um, group discussions um, for the different types of providers and or students to get together. Um, it's been more formal in the past years just to, again, you know, think about how we're treating patients as a clinic, not just as individual providers. Um, and I think we are still thinking about and how to figure, like you were just talking about, figuring out how to um, improve on the team care idea, meaning that the team will be different types of providers providing care for an individual patient. And I think we're still working on, again, the communication piece and how is that going to look within, um, we use Epic for our EMR. And so how to better utilize that system to develop teams or have a more streamlined way of communication. So I think we're, you know, we're still continuing to work on problems and, and think about how to make it more streamlined. Did you want us to go ahead and maybe address some of those questions, Beth? I think this would, this would be a great time to pause and take some questions. And uh, the, the, the questions came from, well, all these questions came from one person who's actually not on the call right now. So mm. what I like to do is just open it up to the, our participants who are on the call, especially uh, Steve has to leave at, at um, half an hour past, and I don't know if Martin has the same obligation. So if it's okay with Barry and Marsha, I would like to open it up ask Steve first if he has any questions and then Martin ask Barry and Marsha just because of time time concerns. Barry, Marsha, does that sound uh, good? Yeah, I'm okay. 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 Yeah. All right. Steve, is there anything you'd like to ask ask before you have to get off the call? Yes, thank you for that. Um, as you were speaking, I was writing down the question about how do you communicate with each other and um, I was also wondering, do you have or do you run something like a grand rounds or uh, have meetings with the various departments, the various specialties that you offer in your clinic? Uh, is that something that you do or you find to be effective? Yeah, definitely. Um, and Jen might be able to speak to this a little bit more. The naturopathic department does that a little bit more than the nutrition department has. Um, I think I think one of the challenges is our campus and our clinic are about 45 minutes apart. And so figuring out, you know, some of the logistics around that can be challenging. I think, personally, I think that if we can move to more of like a virtual format for some of this, um, mm -hmm. it would make it a lot easier because I find it's just difficult to get bodies in a room. And I've tried over the years many times to have a variety of different, a variety of different ways to engage and get people together. Um, and um, those were some of the things that Jen was talking about where we would use the noon time to try to have some organized, you know, organized meetings or grand rounds types of, of um, meetings. And uh, it, it was, it's just been challenging, I think, mm -hmm. in this day and age to get people in, in one space at one time. Yeah, I think you have a great idea of being able to do something virtually mm -hmm. um, or even from the perspective of educating the other, I mean, um, something that we do here now, the acupuncture school is merged with a larger health science university. And so we're spending a lot of effort trying to sort of reach out and seeing, um, educating them as to what our profession does. But it also occurs just within the health professions themselves. Some don't know that pharmacists can provide uh, immunizations, for instance, which I didn't know before either. Um, mm -hmm. But um, yeah, just to a way to, to communicate what all the services are and then um, wondering how when a patient comes in are they sort of they're coming in for something very specific which is they're looking for naturopathic care or is it that they're coming in and they have an ailment and um, you're providing a variety of services to treat that or maybe some sort of approach or protocol that would address you know you, you want to get acupuncture with some nutritional counseling and a little bit of um, you know, mm -hmm. mental health counseling. Is, is that is that sort of mm -hmm. how it yeah, runs? Yeah, most, 
most of our shifts are independent. So someone would come in and they would make an appointment with acupuncture and mm -hmm. maybe acupuncture would refer them to nutrition or counseling. Um, it's only our cardiovascular, our digestive um, wellness, and our pain management that we actually have the, the members, the different people there at the same time. So mm -hmm. other than that, and we do like our, um, um, well, for our diabetes shift, we do have a nutrition shift running at the same time, even though we have a nutritionist on that shift. Mm -hmm. but, um, but for the most part, people are coming in either on referral or self-selecting which modality they want to use. And then it's something that we've been working on, too, trying to educate the students and um, about, about referrals and trying just to get everybody um, comfortable with what everybody does at the clinic so that they can take that broader view. I think it helps to improve the patient experience and also can help bring more revenue to the clinic if we, if we keep mm -hmm. people in, in the clinic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Did you want to add anything, Jennifer? Well, we also have for the community in lieu of a grand rounds, I think, um, um, is it quarterly or twice a year? There's a panel discussion amongst different providers talking about a clinical case or a yeah. clinical presentation. What did they present on IBS recently? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, in nutrition, um, yeah, or behavioral health or counseling will participate. So a member or a, a clinic faculty or faculty member from um, as many of our different um, schools will participate in the panel discussion. And it's held, it's open to the public um, as well as the community. So that's an interesting um, way to engage with the community and for us to also connect. Um, but mm -hmm. it's not every week. We do, the, so the School of Naturopathic Medicine does have a grand round that occurs in the fourth year. And we have been t talking about how to, again, make that more inclusive for um, the other schools to participate and just have more back and forth that the students can participate in as well. Um, but it's not organized at this time. But like Kelly was saying, we do a good job of informally <laughs> and and utilizing at least EPIC that we do have in place to keep each other abreast of what's going on and when we're seeing patients across the different um, areas of the clinic. I think we do a fairly good job with that, but there's room for improvement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. That, that's great. Steve, do you have any follow-up questions or anything else? I don't. I guess I was just getting a, a better understanding of how that works because we, we are looking to do something like that here, but we're just in our beginning phases of yes. considering it, so I was curious. Right, very good. Mm -hmm. I was chatting. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say I was chatting with our um, clinic director. I mean, I've been in the clinic um, for a while and have seen some of the process, but I just wanted to confirm a couple things with our clinic director this morning that, you know, in terms of how we how we add the service lines, um, that there's just a variety of, of ways that that's happened. And a, a big driver for that is just having somebody at the clinic who has a passion for it. <laughs> I know that that's yeah. not... You know, that doesn't that's seem very like. scientific or very market-driven or, you know... Um, but but we do have some checks and balances in place just to make sure that there's some that it makes sense to bring in that kind of a a service like with digestive wellness or with you know immune and pain and pain management and um, I, I forgot we also have pain management and then diabetes. Mm -hmm. I mean these are all very common conditions. So um, I think it makes sense you know to do something like that. But but a big part of it has to do with who has the the time and the energy to really put it together. <laughs> yeah, so my takeaway from a lot of these uh, discussions we've had is that you just need you need an advocate or, or someone who's willing mm -hmm. to run with it and really, you know, be the glue yeah. that puts it all together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because we're all busy enough every day, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, yeah. all. I had to run, but uh, yeah, great talk. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Thank Steve. You. Martin, did you have any questions? Uh, I think, um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay. 
uh, I, I, I think it's it's really been touched on, and you know, I guess my my um, concern around this is the development of you know uh, integrative clinics in anticipation for you know rolling out our first professional doctorate, and really the need to to you know train our students uh, with just greater competency in you know, in a professional and collaborative care. And so, you know, we've got a, a couple of uh, situations, uh, clinical situations, uh, partnerships developing where we're going to be looking at, you know, having um, students and super, uh, acupuncture supervisors along with, you know, whether it's an, maybe an MD or, you know, another uh, nurse practitioner in these settings, you know, Ideally, working in tandem, doing type of uh, kind of grand rounds, um, and mostly just wanting, you know, based on your experience, just uh, just basic information around logistics and you know ways to to handle that. We did this a long time ago with OHSU, and then it it you know this was probably 15 years ago. And it only lasted for a while, and you know, I mean, there's challenges. It's it's going to be it, it, logistically, it's it's more challenging. There are costs associated with it. So, if you have any, you know, suggestions for you know how to how to manage that and make it work, I'd love to hear it. As you were talking, I was thinking um, about some of the challenges we've had. You know, with especially with education in this. And I think one of the things that um, we've been doing is just really focusing on the clinical experience. That once the students get to the clinic, there'll be this expectation of interdisciplinary integration. And um, I think that it needs to be backed up into the curriculum um, so that it transfers into the clinic if we wait till they get to the clinical experience. I think it's too late. And the naturopathic program actually has started this. Our, our naturopathic program, and Jen can speak to this, has started this um, new model of education where there is a lot more inter interdisciplinary um, integration just in terms of like basic sciences and all of the different modalities that they're doing. Um, and I think they're also bringing in some other modalities as well. Um, and so I have a class where I, I bring in a panel of, of different um, modalities to have the students work together. And I try in case studies to bring in, you know, who, who, would, who would we collaborate care with and, you know, what's, what's something, you know, what do we do in nutrition and what do we refer out for. So just trying to, to make it that it's mapped throughout the curriculum and not just at the end, I think, mm -hmm. helps. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know what else I can add other than saying that, yeah, if, it, it, if it's housed in a class, um, some aspect of it is housed in a class, and it's much easier to track. And like you're saying, Kelly, it's nice to have it as soon as possible in the student's education, but we're still trying to figure out exactly how to manifest that. Like you say, we do cases, and we do have um, basic science and the clinical sciences professors working together in the classroom, so that's a different level of integration, but um, yeah, there's, <laughs> there's always more to do. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you for answering those, and thank you for asking. Barry and Marshall, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Um, ask your questions. Perhaps then we, we might want to go to some of the requested ones. So, um, yeah, <laughs> my question has more to do with the um, the issues about where patients should be seen when they can't be seen simultaneously or don't want to see um, <clears throat> individually different providers. Um, both from a scheduling standpoint, but also as a, um, well, NDs do um, nutrition, they do acupuncture. How do, you, how do you sort all that out so that everyone's happy? 
I think one of the thing, challenges we've had is it's really difficult even though it sounds like it would be awesome to have people see multiple providers at the same time, typically it doesn't usually work. <laughs> There's usually an agenda, you know, that that providers have, or 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 uh, maybe agenda is not the right word, but there's. There's a flow to an appointment that needs to happen, and like the naturopath, you know, the primary care has a lot they have to do and accomplish. And so, even when we have nutritionists on the shift. Um, I heard this at a conference, and I think it really is a nice model to think of: is this concept of the warm handoff, which means that you might have the primary, the primary service that they're seeing, and then there might be pieces of another service like nutrition or counseling, where maybe they would have, you know, the primary visit would be the naturopathic visit, and then there would be like a handoff where they'd say, okay, these are the things we think are important. Talk here, the nutritionist is right here. Go and talk to the nutritionist for, you know, 15 minutes, and we can just talk about this one thing. And the value of having the nutritionist involved like that or the counselor is that they might have had some of the background from the appointment. They can just chat with the provider. They don't have to do the whole, you know, detailed intake. They can do these these little bursts of education um, with a patient while they're already there. And if there needs to be more intervention, they can say, okay, well, let's do this and get you going on this and have you come back. But, um, you know, we also have a program in nutrition where we train psychology. They get, a, they get a master's in psychology and nutrition. And what we found is that it's really difficult to do both of those in one appointment. So this idea that you can do it all in one appointment, um, I, think that's I think it's challenging. I mean, maybe if someone had some needles in them, they could get some education, but maybe that's also defeating the point of getting acupuncture. So... Um, if there is this opportunity for warm handoff situations and that if we think about appointments in flexible ways, I think that the model can work pretty well. And I've heard of other clinics who are doing it like that. Um, you know, if there's social work or if there's counseling or, or um, nutrition, um, even if it's physical medicine or something, they might be able to just go get an adjustment or, you know, whatever it is that they might be able to do in that um, warm handoff kind of way. Yeah, yeah I'll I just reiterate. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh -huh. No, go ahead. Well, ideally I think that's true and I think it works that way a lot of times, but it can also, it's hard not to step on toes when that's one person's specialty, but someone else is, uh, has uh, training in it. So let me just use the example of NDs and nutrition. So mm -hmm. NDs take a number of nutrition courses, and mm -hmm. that is a base for where they start commonly, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to the nutritionist, because we also have a nutrition program here. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you, it's a, it's a very sensitive area. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, just like with How do we play nicely in the sandbox? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think we, I, I really have tried to get to know the doctors that I work with and the, um, and we, um, also, I think a lot of a lot of the the um, referrals that we get from the NDs are patients that need a lot more handholding or are very complicated in terms of their needs. Like they have a lot of food sensitivities and you know other needs that takes um, maybe more time than they might have in a nature in the average naturopathic visit. Maybe Jen could speak a little bit more to that. But I think from the the nutrition side, we are very, we try to be very conscientious about, um, about our role as working with the doctors, like not, um, not uh, contradicting care and also um, one of the big sticking points is, has been about dietary supplements that we recognize that we both have that in our scope, but at the clinic we train our nutrition students that 
if if they if a patient is under the active care of an ND that we would treat that like medicine and and let the the NDs take the lead on that and if we had any suggestions we would communicate that with the NDs um, and so we've basically just come to some agreements about how we work together but um, and there are some NDs who don't really refer very much and there are some that refer a lot so it just has to do with how much how much the providers want to practice in that way and I think it's all just a matter of getting to know each other and also letting letting the NDs know what we do a little bit more a lot of times when they come and if they sit in on a visit we'll invite like while they the shifts are happening if an ND shift might not have a uh, if a student might not have a patient we'll invite them to come and sit in on our shift even for an hour just so they can see what we do just to try to build those relationships and get a greater understanding and then if we communicate and we use our referral tabs and things like that it just reduces some of the, the confusion and the stepping on the toes but it's definitely it happens and it's also a teaching clinic so that's another layer right <laughs> that people are still learning can I uh, jump in here this is Martin Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm just curious if uh, for some of the more condition specific or specialty specialty type clinics that I've heard you mention um, at your um, at your schools, um, do you? I mean, have you developed a, a a type of algorithm or flow chart for? you know, who they might see first. You know, I, I get it if it's more just, you know, people just sort of calling in for, you know, and it's not a, a you know, a specialty or condition-specific type of, of clinic. But it seems to me, you know, one of the ways to facilitate what we're discussing here is to have that type of, and it obviously it takes, it takes sitting around a table with the, the different practitioners to sort of agree on that, but is that's something that you do or you've discussed or thought about? Do you think it, that might work? It's just it's really more amusing in the question. We do. We do already have existing, um, and this is, I don't know when this was started, Kelly, maybe you know, but it, 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 I believe it's only in the naturopathic clinic. We have a welcome to wellness visit, mm -hmm. which is a free get-to-know-the-clinic visit that the student clinician and the provider um, explain about the entire clinic to the prospective patient. Um, because in Washington, naturopaths are recognized as primary care, um, you know, we are doing quite a lot of medical management and so oftentimes don't have time to go through nutrition or think about um, how to counsel patients uh, about stressors and things like that. We just genuinely don't have time. So if so that so that helps with referral, I think, to the other providers. But the welcome to wellness visit is really a nice whole you know um, placeholder for the patient just to understand what it is that we provide. And then really we do we will provide our opinion and our thoughts about where the patient should go, but ultimately it's the patient's choice. So the patient can call and start at any point in the clinic that they feel connected to. And, um, you know, our providers are trained and, and will refer out as needed to other, you know, other parts of the clinic, other providers. So what we have in place is working. It would be interesting to think about an algorithm or something else. Um, but we do at least have a free, you know, non-committal um, way of patients learning about what we can provide. Yeah. So, and Jen, you know this, we have a slightly different, but it's an integrative shift, but they are only seen for assessment. There's no recommendations given, but they're seen by multiple providers. So basically it gives them <clears throat> an idea of the different types of disciplines we offer and there's no charge for that visit. They just come in, they see a chiropractor, they see an ND, all students, an ND, um, they see an acupuncture and the uh, acupuncture student and they see a dental hygiene student. So, what school are you at? Uh, University of Bridgeport. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> but it's a little bit of get to know you, but they do an assessment and, you know, uh, decide who the, they make a recommendation to the patient who they think they should see first for a regular visit. The patient obviously gets to decide, but it does come with a recommendation. I think that our, our patient services reps um, will make recommendations when people call in. And there are, you know, because we run shifts, many shifts at the same time, nutrition shifts are running at the same time as, as um, the naturopathic shifts and many times acupuncture, we've had people come in to our nutrition shift and say, oh, I thought I was seeing a doctor. And then we can say, well, let's go see if there's one you can see. And, and you know, occasionally that happens. But, um, you know, there's often, even if, um, if they have, a, a, you know, an issue that needs to be seen um, and evaluated by a doctor, sometimes we can give them some nutritional um, advice around that and then, you know, hand them off. It just depends on the person. Yeah, we've tried to take that <clears throat> um, analysis part of the uh, job off the shoulders of the uh, customer service representatives in the front, mm. hoping that um, we can help them, we can help the patient with, since we have more information than they will. But I can see where that would be an, a, a smart move as well, to have your customer service do that. Um, are there um, any concerns or things you would change if you could in terms of the documentation that's shared among all of the different disciplines? I just wish we had a better way to communicate with each other in a HIPAA compliant way in real time. Um, I just Amen. Had I have this dream of having some sort of system where, say we're running like three naturopathic shifts, a nutrition shift, and a counseling shift, and an acupuncture shift. If everyone could log into a system and go, hey, I've got a free hour. Hey, I've got this patient with this. Who should I send? You know, like just, it's sort of like Facebook or something that we could all be on communicating. I think it would be awesome. I just think the communication piece overall is is the biggest challenge in all of this. And... Um, I think there's opportunities for technology. I, I'm not technologically savvy to design anything like that, but um, I mean, I've heard that there are some programs like that, but I haven't I haven't seen it. Um, and I mean, I think in terms of our electronic health record, I wish that we could customize it more, but <laughs> it's hard. We have, like we, I said, we or like Jen said, we use Epic, and we don't have as much control over you know what everything looks like. I think um, for the most part, that's helped us a lot in, in terms of just cutting down on additional charting and whatnot. But I just think the communication piece um, that would be my hope. Thanks. I just want to mention that Ron Besh, uh, who who submitted these questions, is on now. He had difficulty with, with our. So Barry, if you want to ask any questions you have, and then in the remaining time we could uh, devote to Ron's questions. Uh, I will. I don't know if it's a question or a statement. I haven't figured that out, so I'll just blurt it. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, earlier on, there was discussion about the warm handoff and. Uh, how uh, helpful it can be for patients to have, you know, flexible or flexibility in the appointments to, uh, you know, even temporarily or, or not temporarily, but partially address uh, budding concerns or uh, allowing the ability to go speak to someone about something in a consult fashion quickly. But the, the operations part of my cortex um, started shouting when I heard that because it seemed as though that could result, uh, that kind of ideology or that approach could be could run up against difficulties that uh, come with scheduling. 
Um, I mean, everybody's got a schedule, typically, anyway. And mm -hmm. uh, and if you operate under a premise that, well, I'm sure you know Joe's available. Let's go down and see if we can talk to him. Oftentimes, mm -hmm. you're going to be disappointed, and you'll have a disappointed patient in tow because mm -hmm. Joe's got a schedule and he's already he's not available. I'm curious if you've run into problems with with promotion of a flexible approach in scheduling. Mm -hmm. Well, what we've often found is that um, yes, obviously people have schedules and. Sometimes, you know, sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. And there's also a model for, that I've seen with other clinics where they might have providers that are more floating and not, um, you know, maybe not the doctor, the doctors aren't floating, but maybe some of the other providers like social workers and nutritionists and such are floating, knowing that they're there for the warm handoffs. And, and you can do billing in those circumstances around like 15-minute increments and things. Um, but I also, um, uh, one of the things that we do frequently, if there isn't an appointment available or nobody's available for anything in depth, is that we can often find somebody to do, introduce to the patient and say, we don't have time to meet with you right now, but I just wanted to introduce you to Dr. Johnson and, or I wanted to introduce you to the nutritionist so that they have a connection for when they and say, yeah, if you want to go and schedule, we can have you come back here, you know, shake your hand and meet you just for that personal sure. touch. And, and oftentimes people can just step out for a second and do that. Yeah, um, or, there's a, or there's a student. So it's just some sort of personal touch. I appreciate um, that. That helps. That's good. That's, good. That, that's a good answer. It helps, helps me understand. Thank you for that. Uh-huh. Well, this is wonderful, and our timing is working out very nicely. So, Ron, I'm really glad the last link that, that, uh, that I sent you was able to work. Glad you're on the call. Your questions are on the screen, and we have five minutes left. So why don't you take it from here, Ron? Sorry you missed the presentation, um, but it, it is recorded. So, Ron, uh, do you want to ask any of your questions? So I know Ron is on, and maybe he's, uh, I, don't, I don't really know, but having trouble being, maybe he doesn't. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you all can hear me well. I'm yeah. In the Sounds like there may be some, there may be some can connectivity. Can you hear me okay? On and off, Ron, but we hear you now. Okay, sorry about that. I'm walking. Uh, okay. Uh, mine is more about determining the future service line. I guess the questions, you could just answer those, um, just kind of run through. I just want to make sure that as I add service lines, um, what would you recommend and where would you look to get like the data to determine feasibility, um, revenue cycles, issues like that so that uh, the powers that be above me see the feasibility from a financial end. I see it from a care end, obviously, very easily. I was asking our clinic director um, more about that this morning, and I think um, I think it's uh, it's, it's I think I'll just say it's challenging to be able to project. And you know, these types of care models are often um, they 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 have potential to not have the same kind of revenue generation as um, more of the traditional go to a visit and have, you know, the billing for that. But I think one of the things that um, our director said is that uh, what we need to do is, if we're bringing on a new service, is to think about, um, first of all, who's going to be the champion for that. Um, really looking at, I mean, market or um, insurance is insurance going to cover this in any way? Are there creative ways I mentioned with nutrition we can bill in 15-minute increments so that can make it really easy? Um, you know, um, I don't know. I'm. It's a little out of my, I'm not usually on the deciding end for a lot of these types of things. I'm more on the implementation or just idea generation. But I don't okay. know, Jen, are you involved more with that aspect of it? 
Um, not as closely as I <laughs> would like. I mean, basically, yeah, it, it, it is definitely a concern as far as, um, you know, would a new modality or, or clinic shift be um, budget neutral? I think everyone is always excited about that and or if it's actually going to generate money. Um, we always have the fallback of some financial support from students paying tuition because of the nature of the teaching clinic. There is some offset for at least what we're paying the faculty um, based on tuition dollars. But then, you know, in a perfect world, any service that we're providing should be providing some income to the clinic itself. And so I think, like Kelly was saying, looking at if there is insurance reimbursement, how much that is, and just, you know, working through the numbers. Um, mm -hmm. Historically, we are trying to become a little bit more savvy with this and thinking about what services um, are, are needed out there and also what, you know, people are excited to, what patients are excited to pay for or even come in for on a regular basis. We do survey our, our patients to find out if they're happy with the care and if there's anything that they, you know, any additional services. I mean, they're, when we survey the, the patients, sometimes that helps us to determine whether or not. Um, I mean, we added our digestive wellness shift, uh, I think, because we were just bursting at the seams with SIBO patients on every here or there and everywhere, and we just figured if we could make it where they were all kind of in one place, that would make it easier to manage. Um, and with the diabetes shift, I mean, that's just such a common condition. I mean, you could probably start with some of the, you know, major chronic chronic diseases, pain management, you know, diabetes, cardiovascular, like digestive, those kind of things, food allergies, something like that. But um, I think when it comes down to the interdisciplinary piece, figuring out what insurance would cover for those services. We also have, in nutrition, we don't take insurance. We do $20 visits. So that's another decision our clinic made just to, again, we're trying not only, you know, obviously the financial piece for the clinic is very important, but we're really focused in on, on education for the students and trying to make sure that they have enough patients yeah. to see. So um, I think it's challenging when you're looking at this from a model that's maybe not a teaching clinic where you don't have the additional revenue, but um, creative ways to bring in insurance, I think, um, is probably one one way to offset that. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. Um, I work at a, a, a college, and of course we have the same thing where we use tuition dollars to help offset, but um, as things change historically with... Um, Ron, I am so, so sorry to cut you off, but 